Let's see, recording. So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the final workshop or part of the Legacy Project. Uh, my name is Obda Munders here. I am the Oral History Project Manager at the Weeksville Heritage Center. Um, and uh, really excited that we're coming to this final workshop of what has been a three-year project um, where we have been introducing our audiences and communities and stakeholders to the archives at the Weeksville Heritage Center um, through three three branches of the program. So the first being our public programming with the last iteration being um, Sensing History, which occurred in October. Um, the internship program, which uh, attempted to create more diversity within uh, the archives, which is a predominantly white um, profession. And then also the public training um, workshop series in which we have been following on the impetus and hopes of Do um, Dr. Joan Maynard, who uh, whose wish uh, when creating the Weeksville Heritage Center um, was to create archivists and historians of color uh, for the future. So with the workshops that we provide, we provide um, training in personal um, preservation and um, archiving where people learn how to do um, genealogy, oral history, um, digital storytelling and um, archiving. So the workshops that we've had in this season or in this final iteration, the first one was Oral History With Me, which happened in early October. Then in November, we had um, archival digging and, um, um, and social media work with Onawana Sula Olasunde, and then we had um, Genealogy, Genealogy 101 with Jermaine Dennis, who was a former intern of the Legacy Projects. And then um, last week we had Digital Research Methods with Dr. Robin Naughton of Queens College. And um, today we will um, have our final workshop on genetic genealogy with Dr. Doris Withers, um, who um, was with us uh, in the first year of this program and um, we'll be closing it out. And I'm really excited about this. Um, so the way that this workshop is going to move forward is I will um, briefly introduce Dr. Withers. Uh, she will uh, go into the program um, or go into the workshop. And um, by around 7, 710, we will end the workshop and open it up for Q and A. So, um, if you have any questions during the workshop, feel free to um, put them in the chat. I will make sure that they will be lined up accordingly for Dr. Withers to answer during the Q and A. And um, you know, by the time we're in Q and A, I'll also allow people to um, unmute themselves so that they can ask and interact with um, Dr. Withers and each other. So. Um, well, without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Withers, who is um, Professor Emeritus of Biology and Education um, at uh, Mega Evers and is among the founding faculty. Uh, she has had a long career of service to the college beginning in 1972. Her career at the college has encompassed broad experiences in teaching, curriculum development, research, and higher education administration. Um, she has researched and written about adult scientific thinking and learning and about general education and science uh, college teaching. And uh, Dr. Withers is currently uh, working on a partnership grant with the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, you can tell me if that is still going on, Dr. Withers, uh, mm -hmm. and NIH and the Smithsonian to develop genomic lessons and to pilot them in six Brooklyn high schools. So, uh, and uh, she was also in last week's program in regards to Kwanzaa Fest with uh, Sharon Gordon, who is also here with us today. So uh, I'm going to end the introduction uh, there and allow Dr. Withers to take it away. And um, again, I'm just really excited for this workshop. Oh, thank you, Obden. Um, hello, everyone. It's good to see us here today. Uh, I'm going to, um, well, I should do my share screen first because I have a little overview. Let me see where is share screen. 
Okay. All righty. That's in the beginning. You don't want, that's the end. You don't want to see, see that. Okay. All righty. Okay. Can you see now? Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, good. Um, there's someone waiting to come in too. Okay. Um, well, we're going to talk about African Americas. I, I put A on it because I mean the S on it because I really do mean the Americas. Uh, Ancestry by DNA, and it's a story of discovery and revelation. And anyway, this is kind of the overview. Uh, some parts I'll go through rather quickly, and other parts we will sp uh, spend a little more time on. But I'll talk a first about genealogy, and then some issues about African American genealogy, some challenges, and a brief view overview. Then we'll have a brief um, DNA lesson on chromosomes, nucleus, mitochondria, and genome. Believe me, it's brief. I call it a little bit of DNA, a little bit of biology. Then I'll talk a little bit about the human genome and two new fields that have come out as a result of the new uh, genetics. One is called genetic anthropology and genetic genealogy. Then we'll, I'll introduce you to the DNA ancestry com companies and the types of genetic ancestry tests. We have uh, some examples of what they call mitochondrial uh, DNA tests and it's called that helps you to identify your deep maternal ancestry and that's when I'm going to invite Sharon Gordon to come and talk to us about what her experience has been. I'll tell you something about the Y DNA test and the deep paternal ancestry of that and I'm, I will use an example actually of my family um, share that with you. The last part will be about autosomal DNA ancestry testing and Sharon will come back and discuss some, th some of that with us. And uh, that's the one that a lot of people are interested in now. And one of the ones that really is um, actually more popular, but all of them are interesting to me. And then that's some additional comments, very short, and then questions and answers. So that's the, the rather, uh, I, I would say really, optimistic outline of what we're going to do today, but some parts will go through quickly. Well, the roots phenomenon. It is said that um, this visiting professor from UCLA actually said that Alex Haley did more to popularize genealogy than anybody in the 20th century. And he says, I think of Alex Haley as the one who took the snobbery out of genealogy. And if some of you who are looking on uh, may remember the 1976 books of, of called Roots. And it was four year, four months on the New York Times bestseller list. It won a, a, a National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. And it also resulted in the, in the uh, TV eight part series called Roots. And I remember all of my people who were back there and adults, they were really interested and in, glued to the television to see each of those episodes. It, by the way, was remade in 2016. But anyway, it really inspired all of this genealogy stuff, not just among um, African Americans, but they really believe among all of Americans. But in particular, it simulated an interest in African American history and genealogy. And all of us want to know something about ourselves. Alex Haley said, in fact, in all of us, there is a hunger, moral deep, to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we came from. In every conceivable manner, family is the link to our past, bridge to our future. And there's also a quote in uh, the Christian Bible, which says, well, actually, this is probably in, in uh, the Old Testament, which says, remember the days of old, consider the generations long past, Ask your father and he will tell you, your elders, and they will explain to you. Well, we sometimes don't get to ask our elders because sometimes we don't know enough about our own genealogy to be able to get some of that information. And 
this because there's some challenges to um, African-American genealogy. First of all, a lot of our knowledge, a large portion of our history and heritage has been denied to us because we were migrated forcibly to the Americas and also within the US, also what they call domestic slave trade. And then there is an admixture of us doing slavery. That means that we have some European American in our history, but we weren't, that was not documented. And it turns out that on average, uh, African Americans at least have about 20 to 30% European ancestry. And it wasn't until 19, 1850 that Africans uh, were listed anyway, except in the slave schedules, where they just put the slave owner's name and how many slaves they had. There was no, nothing about their um, gender or their names or anything like that. There were some free African-Americans in the United States, about 12%, 11 to 12%. And you can find them listed with the other um, people in the census. In 1850 and 1860, before the emancipation of enslaved Africans in this country, they started to uh, list the age, gender, and race. They use black or mulatto in the slave schedule. So you can go back and look at some of that if you know some things about your own family um, that you can use to, to kind of identify if these people listed there are in fact your relatives. Um, but you have to go and find, you have to know the slave master's name to even find that. But in 1870, was the first time the census, the census reported name, sex, rates, and date in place of birth. And that's where a lot of us who are interested in genealogy would uh, try to look for something. If we knew where our uh, original people were in the States, we would look there. There are also some other records. One is the Freedmen's Bureau, but everybody's not in the Freedmen's Bureau, but there is, that is actually online and you can look that up and see some things about it. I noticed that uh, Linda Jones, Ro Rose Jones is here today and she is a wonderful genealogist and a lot of this stuff I, I um, learned in greater detail working and listening to her. At any rate, this is the, ex this is the um, middle passage the Mayafa, and as you know, the term Mayafa means disaster or terrible or great tragedy. And the Middle Passage was a terrible occurrence or a great tragedy when all of these Africans were taken mainly from the west coast of Africa, and you'll see along this area right here, and taken to the Americas. There were only about a half a million uh, Africans who were taken to North America, most of the uh, forced migration of Africans went to the to what they say West Indians, we say Caribbean now. And the largest amount really to Brazil, 5 million, a little bit to Central America and some to the um, Western shore of South America. But as you can see, over from 1650, and actually it's actually even before then as the 1500s, uh, a huge number of, of, of Africans were forcibly, forcibly migrated to the Americas. I thought I'd just show you uh, some of the prominent tribes or um, ethnic groups is better that were <coughs> taken from the African continent to the Americas, and you'll see the areas too, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, that, that they were taken from and the places that they were taken to um, in the Americas. And if you'll notice uh, a lot, the largest amount were taken to the Carolinas and Georgia and the Chesapeake area, which would be Maryland and Virginia, basically. And you notice Cuba, Jamaica and Dominique, they had quite, they had a large number of Africans taken there. And these, this, um, these are some of the ethnic groups. They're actually, this uh, book by um, Gwendolyn 
Mildo Hall actually lists a lot of these from some research that she has done. Quite an interesting book, um, and and um, good reading. It's it's quite technical in some respects, but it's an interesting book that'll give you more information. The other thing I thought I'd mention, because it it also affects your genealogy, is that once um, enslaved people were brought to the United States, there was domestic slave trade. In other words, taking people from the East Coast of this of United States to the various parts in West and to the South uh, and Deep South states. And in fact, um, in 1808, Congress outlawed any new Africans coming to this country. Um, but from 1810 to 1860, over 2 million enslaved African people were forcibly transferred from the Eastern seaboard westward to the Black Belt, Mississippi, Alabama, that was called, the, those were the cotton states, as well as Tennessee and Arkansas. A lot of those, by the way, worked in some of the mines. Okay, here's my little bit of biology. DNA is the information molecule. If you want to find DNA, you have to go, all of our cells contain DNA. And if you see a cell, you go to the nucleus, and inside the nucleus are the structures known as chromosomes. And that's where our genes are, the things that tell us, you know, to determine our characteristics. And genes are actually made up of this molecule called DNA. And DNA is made of little pieces that are strung together. They're represented by A, T, Gs, and Cs. For those who want to know a little bit of biochemists, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, but we just can call them A, T, and G, and Cs. And they're strung in a particular sequence, and that sequence determines what your, uh, what the genes are. And I just illustrate this right here. There's actually DNA is a two-stranded molecule, and the A, Ts, and Gs actually uh, connect the two strands. An A is always next to a T and a G is always next to a C. And that's why they call the molecule a double helix because it's, it's two strands that are twisted. The other thing I wanted to mention in this biology lesson is that inside the cell, but not in the nucleus, is another little structure called a mitochondrion. And there are really many, many, many uh, mitochondria in a cell. These mitochondria also have a little bit of DNA in them. And we'll talk about that later, about why that's important. And you can get some ancestry from the DNA in mitochondria. Okay, here's what, when you talk about all the DNA in humans, it's called the human genome. It just means all the DNA that, uh, that we have in our cells. Quick, quick biology lesson. We actually have 22 pairs of chromosomes plus the sex chromosomes. And those 22 pairs are called autosomes. And in the females, the, the sex chromosomes are matched XX. And in the female, I mean, in the male, the, X chromo the sex chromosomes are not matched XY. And Y is the thing that determines if an individual is a male. I also point out in the human genome that there also is the mitochondria, are the mitochondria, because they contain DNA also. And you also can get, know that you get half of your DNA, 23, 23 chromosomes from your mother in the egg, and 23 chromosomes from your father in the sperm. And they are matched to give you the 46 chromosomes, the 23 pairs of chromosomes that you have. And guess what? That's all of the DNA lesson we're going to have. Okay. In 2003, there was a project called the Human Genome Project. And in that project, scientists worked on the human genome for 13 years, and they figured out all of the, what they would call sequences of the pieces of that DNA. And that, that project was called the Human Genome Project. But out of it came some very interesting information. They found that different, the DNA does change over, um, over the 2,000 to 150,000 years that modern day humans existed. And 
looking at those little mutations or changes in DNA, you could actually tell when a particular group of people came into being. It'll put them in a specific time and a specific place in history. And I'll show you a, a little um, map in a minute. So it is these changes in your DNA that tell you your ancestry, ancestral story and your origins and also where your uh, people originally came from. And this study is called genetic anthropology. That's a new science, relatively new science that has emerged. And so it actually looks at DNA, differences in DNA, physical evidence and linguistics to reveal the history of modern human origins, how they moved over the whole planet uh, and that history of that movement. So we can look at our Homo sapiens, that's our scientific name, and look at the modern day human beings and we can learn something about them. And the thing that uh, came out of the Human Genome Project and Genetic Anthropology is that all humans alive today can trace their ancestry back to Homo sapiens that lived in East, Sub-Saharan East Africa about 150,000 years ago. In other words, this MRCE stands for most recent common ancestor, which means all humans are related to that common ancestor that was 150,000 years ago. And they have a name for the female and that's called mitochondrial Eve. And they have a name for that our original um, male, really it's a male clan really, it's called y, y chromosomal Adam. So they were in Africa for quite a while and then a, a group of them started to migrate out of Africa and that about 65,000 years ago and all of those, those few people who left Africa moved over the next 65,000 years to populate the entire continent and the entire um, world. Okay, let me see if I can get, I wanna go to the next slide, come on. This is a, a graphic that shows this. If you'll notice, here is, here are, here's Africa and the original uh, Homo sapiens or um, mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosomal Adam clans were right here. They also migrated within Africa, but they also left Africa and first went into this area here, then went into Asia and then back over into Europe. And then they crossed over the Bering Strait into the Americas. And that was the last group of um, last land masses that were populated by Homo sapiens. So that carried, it depends on when you read it, 15,000 to 35,000 years ago. Okay, so that's good. Sankofa, which is uh, a symbol that many of you uh, are familiar with. And it actually is an Adinkra symbol that means looking in the past to help you to understand both the good and bad. And I put the DNA molecule there because if you examine the DNA molecule, you can reveal a little bit about your ancestor in the past. Um, there's, uh, Steve Olson has written a very interesting book. If you get a chance to read it, it's called Map in Human History, Genes, Race and Our Common Origins. But he said in that book, human DNA is virtually limitless repository, not just of biomedical, but of historical information, a sort of molecular parchment on which an account of our species has been written. So DNA tells the story of the journey of our species. It connects one generation to all the generations before. It tells us how we are all related and how our ancestors got where they are today. We are effectively cousins, separated by about 2000 generations. In other words, our history is written in our DNA. So here's genetic genealogy. It is using genetics to give some additional information to, to traditional genealogy. The focus is the DNA molecule and it used DNA testing to determine ancestry. And I'm gonna see if I can show you this brief 
I think we tried it before, but I think I'm gonna to have to do it this way. To show you this, it's only a minute. I'm gonna show you this um, little video. Let me see, oops, nope, that's not it. Uh, da, 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 da. Actually, it is it, I have to go over here to, oh shoot, I can't get it. Let me get at that. I'm trying to get to the other link here. Nope, that's not it. Let me close that. I can't, I don't know what I can get. We had problems with getting it in the actual, um, let me see if I can make this work. If it doesn't, um, yeah. Can you see this? It says genetic genealogy. No, it says introduction to Miletic molecular gene genealogy. It doesn't show, I have to go another way to show this. It's only a minute, but it's very well uh, done. Do you so, need to unshare and then share again and share that screen? Oh yeah, that's right. That's what it Thank is. you. I can, yes. Okay, wait a second. I knew there was a way to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, here, uh, let me go. I gotta go here. And I have to stop sharing what you're sharing. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me go to this um, again. And I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll link to it. Then I'll stop the share. And then I'll share again. I think that's how you do it. Okay. We're about to find yeah, out. Yeah. Let me see if it's how you do it. Where is it? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Here it is. Can you see it now? Yes. yes. Okay, dokey. I knew there was a way. Mm -hmm. but I... <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome. here it is. It's only a minute, but it's a nice little video. Introduction to Molecular Genealogy. A family tree shows the relationships of children and parents back through time. Through the study of genealogy, it's often possible to build a very large family tree. Genealogy involves going back through written historical records that document major life events, such as births and marriages. But the written record is incomplete. Many written records have been lost or destroyed over the years. And in many cases, births and marriages were never recorded. The result is a dead end in the family tree. Inside our bodies, we carry another record of our family relationships. It is our DNA. DNA analysis can provide clues about what part of the world our ancestors came from. And it may even help to identify relatives with whom we share a common ancestor. Molecular genealogy uses a combination of recent advances in reading human DNA, along with traditional genealogy. By combining DNA analysis with traditional genealogy, it's possible to go much deeper into our ancestry than the written record alone can take us. Okay, let me, uh, minimize that. Okay, can you see this, the next screen? No, you haven't minimized yet. I have to, yeah, okay, let me. Stop sharing. Uh, stop sharing, that's right. Mm -hmm. You're always then I'll go back to share screen. Mm -hmm. No, wait a minute, do I have to? Yes, it's there. You see it? No, yeah. Okay. You have to share it again. Okay, we'll do. Oops. I'll get better at this, but it would just come up. It's not, oh, I know where it is. Um, I'm trying to get my, my um, let's see. Okay, now I can share the screen again, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I can go back to the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And then I can share that. <laughs> and then I can... There you go. Go to present, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to present it. Sometimes it's a little slow, I found. Mm. Oh, so that's what it is. Well, I'm not going to do it the way you need to do it. I'm going to go this way. Okay.
Yes. Okay, I'm back where I need to be. So when you you can you can take genetic anthropology, genealogy, and look at the African diaspora, and it helps us to bridge that, that gap, as it said in the um, brief video. And the little changes in your DNA that take a long time to happen, really thousands of years. So you can kind of place those changes in a time frame, and also identify people based on that. And so through the DNA, you can actually find out what's sub branch of human types based on whether they say biogeographical origins. It just means where your ancestor was in um, the different regions in the in the world. And they call that biogeographical origins. And sometimes you see it as ethnicity. So for the African diaspora, using that to bridge the gap, you can compare your own genetic lineage to those people who are living all over the world right now. And you can reveal some things that cause you to think about, oh gee, what is that about? And it can be historically informative. And also it can, for us people of the African diaspora, it can be restorative because we can actually say, oh, I can see now my relative came from a particular region, my ancestor. Okay, the, the ancestor DNA companies, the ones that, these are some of them, there are a lot of others. Um, these are some of the new ones, Telo Years, Nebula Genomics. I'm not gonna, I, I, I just mentioned those so you'll know them. But the most popular ones are Ancestry, um, DNA Ancestry, My Heritage, Family Tree DNA, and 23andMe. The, the newest one that's coming up is Living DNA. But the one we're gonna do some, find out from the, this, this, in this talk is 23andMe. Okay, here's something about these, they call it direct-to-consumer testing. And they used to, the, the first group that really started to do direct-to-consumer testing was the National Genographic Project, which is in 20, um, started in 2005. And basically all they, they did testing of the Y uh, chromosome and the mitochondria. They started to do testing of all the chromosomes they're called autosomal testing in 2016, but they no longer do that. That ended in June, 2020. 23andMe was the first company that, that started doing autosomal testing in 2017. It stopped in 2013 for some reasons because the FDA didn't want them to continue to give medical information, information but it was reinstated in 2015. And Ancestry DNA started in 2012, and they are actually the biggest company. 50% all 50% of all the DNS HS sold today are sold by Ancestry DNA. And if you turn your attention to this graph, there's like a an exponential increase from 2013 to 2019 uh, of, of uh, DNA tests that have been sold from five million to up to 30 million. And that's quite an, um, uh, quite an increase. And these, this is a graph that really shows you the size of the information that these different companies have in their databases. Ancestry DNA is the biggest one. It has over 16 million um, participants or samples of DNA in their database, followed by 23andMe which has 12 million. Family Tree has a little, a little bit over a million. My, my Heritage has 3 million plus. And GEDmatch, which is not a testing company, it's a place where you can store your, submit your DNA sequence if you like. I'm not gonna talk about GEDmatch because it's not a testing company, but I mention it because a lot of people have heard of GEDmatch. It's, it's, it's a, database that allows people after they get this sequence from one of these companies to put that up and to, to load it into their database. This is the database in which they were able to identify the Golden State murderer by taking some DNA and matching it. And that's a very interesting story about Jed Match, but I won't talk about that today. Anyway, um, what are the types of genetic tests? There's the Y chromosome where they actually look at the sequences on the, the DNA pieces sequence on the Y chromosome. And it tells you something about your deep 
maternal ancestry. And only, as you know, males can do that because us we females do not have a Y. If you have a Y, you are a male. But every, both males and females do have mitochondria. And that's another test. That test will tell you something about your deep, deep maternal ancestry. And it actually goes, is transmitted from mother to her children, whether they're male or female. But the next generation, it is the daughter who passes it to her daughter, who passes it to her daughter and so forth. There is also a test just of the X uh, chromosome. And most people don't um, do with that and, until much later. You can, females have two of them and males have one X chromosome. And it can tell you a little bit about your more recent maternal ancestry, particularly with males. But that isn't um, commonly done. The one that is really uh, very much uh, people are interested in is called autosomal DNA or AT DNA test. And that's the one that looks at all 22 pairs of your chromosomes plus uh, the sex chromosomes. And if you remember, you get half from your mother, one set from your mo mother, and one set from your father to get those 23 pairs. And that's known as biogeographical distribution, also known as ethnicity. And it's, it's presented in percent of African ancestry, European ancestry, Asian ancestry, Native American ancestry. And uh, that is what you'll see in a report. And we have some examples today. Okay, summary. Here is a pedigree. And if you notice uh, the blue line is the father line, goes from the father to father to father to the brother. They have a Y and you that's the Y that's tested to see what your ancestry is, deep ancestry. It even goes way, way back. You'll learn a little bit about that. Your sister, once again, will get her deep maternal ancestry from the mother line, but so will the brother. Of course, he will not pass it on, but the daughter, the sister or the daughter will pass it on. And then the autosomal testing tests all of the, all of the DNA from all of these ancestors. Okay, here, here here's the mother, the brother and the sister. Their autosomal testing will actually look at the DNA that they have, which is came from all of their ancestors, not just, just the Y or the mitochondria. Okie dokie. All right, now we're getting to the interesting part. Uh, some companies have you, you take a DNA sample. One way is that they collect, um, it's actually, it's not the right way. It should be the other way around. <laughs> I should change it now. Um, well, let me change it now. I think I will. No, I won't. This should be collect saliva, which is this one. And this one here is the cheek swab. I think I should change it. I could do it very easily. Uh, okay. Paste. This one. De, 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 de. See how easy that was? That was Good. easy. <laughs> that was easy. I don't want to confuse. Mm -hmm. What is to use this little um um what is this thing? Scraper, but that's not what you call it. Anyway, and you scrape it on your cheek and you put it in some liquid and you seal it up and send it. That's one way. The other way is you actually spit in a in a tube, just a little bit. It's about one cc of saliva, and then you mix it with some liquid, and you send that off. Uh, those are the two ways in which you can collect the DNA sample. In those samples are some cells, and all cells contain some DNA in the nucleus as well as from the mitochondria. So anyway, when you do that, you mail it off, and then generally you register it on the internet and then you track the progress on the internet at your unique, um, using your unique password and uh, uh, login and password. And they don't let you know we've got your results. So you have to check back periodically and they'll say your results are ready. And you can look at them and you can print them out. You also can choose to participate in other projects that the company may or may not be doing. And you have a chance to say yes or no. 
Okay, now we have the interesting part. Um, what we did is we uh, asked uh, a participant to submit their sample to 23andMe. And Sharon Gordon is one of those persons that did that. And what I, I want Sharon to uh, answer this. What did you want? Why did you want to take that DNA test? And uh, you did the 23andMe ancestry test. What was your experience with taking the sample for the test? Sharon, can you talk to us? Well, uh, to be honest, thank you so much for this wonderful um, presentation, Dr. Withers. I'm so intrigued like everyone else. And folks are asking, will there be a recording of this? So just so you know, people are really excited. Um, at first, I did not want to take um, a DNA test. Mm -hmm. I had no interest. I've always felt like the man was up to no good with our DNA and with any kind of testing. Um, <laughs> as a child coming out of the 60s and 70s and knowing my history of the Tuskegee experiments and all the experiments and, and all that has happened and what DNA was used for. And I was a little hesitant. And then I started to get educated by one Dr. Withers. And in getting educated by Dr. Withers, I um, proceeded to do the saliva um, test. Mm -hmm. And it actually came back sooner than we thought, um, Dr. Did. Withers, right? Mm -hmm. it came back in a very timely manner. I think it was three weeks. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot. Now I am totally intrigued. I am hooked. The process was simple. It was easy. Mm -hmm. Very, very, um, a lot of checks and balances in place. So yeah. you can tell that they protect your privacy. Yeah. And I feel like I am a sleuth, like I'm now on the journey to go find out some more about myself. Yeah. Well, you know, Sharon, we're going to share a little bit of what you found out. Okay. Uh, is the student here, Ogden? Is she here? They're not here. I'm going to send them an email. And... Okay. We had a, we also had two students, a male and a female, but they didn't have their results back in time, but somehow or another Sharon got <laughs> hers back and we were going to share her stuff. They're going to share it in a minute, but let me go back. Oops. To share screen. Where am I? Yes. Here I am. Share. Okay. And we should be able to Okay, thanks, Sharon. We're, we're gonna come back to you. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I've worked with um, well over six, 700 people since maybe about 2006 on DNA and ancestry. And I always ask them, why do they want to do ancestry tests? And I have a lot of data on that, but I thought I would share some of the general uh, things that uh, particular people of the African diaspora said. And some people said they wanted to verify the family line. They wanted to learn something about their ethnicity, learn and something about their admixture, you know, what percent of this or that. Some said they wanted to uncover a story. I remember one, um, and I think Linda was with us with this um, person we were working with at a little workshop. It was that it was at Weeksville. She always wanted to find out something about her. Uh, Native American ancestry. And it showed up in a significant percentage in her DNA percentages. And she really was very excited about it because it, it helped to say to her, yes, I do have some significant uh, Native American ancestry. And her, her percentage was quite, quite large. And I'll show you a little bit about that later on with the average uh, look of the um, different uh, percentages in African Americans. But the most, um, some said they just wanted to find out. But the one that I, that came up the most is the people wanted to learn something about their African ancestry. Because that's the very part that we have as a, a group, a cultural group, a historical cultural group have been denied. And so, um, there's also some research to uncover the diversity and relatedness of all people in the Af African diaspora. But, and I've, I've done some research on that and found that some of the types that you see in the Caribbean, you see the same types over here in the America and as my, Amer in the United States. And as my grandmother who didn't know anything about this used to say, oh, 
the people and they call them the islands. That's what she called them. You know what they did? They brought the ship over and dropped some people off from Africa, dropped some people off there over in the, in the islands, and then they kept going and dropped some more of them over here in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in America, meaning U.S. And actually, she was talking about a historical fact. There were slave ships that brought people from the African continent, made a stop somewhere in the Caribbean, and then maybe picked up some or, or, the, or either took some that came from Africa and came on over here to the United States. So usually in places like South Carolina, also in Maryland too, and dropped off these people to be enslaved. So I guess my grandmother had heard that from her, maybe from her mother or her mother's mother. Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, the two deep ancestry tests. One is mitochondrial DNA and the other is Y DNA. What do they tell us? Well, the mitochondrial DNA test uh, identifies what they call a haplogroup. And I'll tell you what that is that in a minute. But that haplogroup will tell you the deep maternal ancestry where your ancestral mother, and that's going back like, I don't know, a hundred of generations. Uh, where that mother, your ancestral mother, was located on this planet. The Y DNA test does the same for males. It gives you your deep paternal ancestry. And the way in which they indicate this, they'll say you belong to a particular haplogroup, which is really a, it's kind of like a blood type. You have a blood type, say it's O, well, you belong to a particular blood group called O. So you know that you belong to that group. It's kind of true. It's kind of what happens with a haplogroup. A haplogroup is a group of people who are located in a particular region of the planet. And if you had that particular haplogroup, your haplotype will be in that location. And the way it's named, I'm gonna show you some of this in a minute. It's named using letters and numbers indicating where that particular um, deep maternal or, an, or maternal ancestry is found. So let me give you an example. What we're looking at Y chromosome is that you're really looking at this ancestry here from yourself back many, many generations to that your most recent ancestor in that line, male line. The, Mitochondria will give you something for the male and the female, but it actually will tell you your deep, deep, deep maternal ancestry going back maybe 400, 300 generations. That's why they call it deep ancestry. Autosoma looks here and we'll talk about that later. But look, here's a distribution of what they call maternal haplogroups. And you'll notice that they are in the letters are really found in a particular region. If you notice, here's Africa. And the haplogroups there, are you, the letters are used, the L and numbers. And we're gonna get an example of that. L0 is really mitochondrial Eve. And if you notice, she's in East Africa and Sub-Saharan sub East Africa. And over many, many years, thousands of years, as they moved around in Africa, there were slight changes. So there are different haplogroups that are in certain locations in Africa. I want to draw your attention to L3. L3, some members of the L3 clan were the ones that moved out of Africa to eventually populate the whole world. So all of these other people, um, females in the world are related to the African haplogroup L3. And if you look down here, they give you um, thousands of age and years. This is thousands of years. The L type is anywhere from 200,000 years to 130,000 years. And if you look over here, as you notice, the different ones have different ages. That's when they got in that region. For example, if we look at, um, I'll see if I can find R, R, R. Um, 
values. No, you is a common one we see in Africa, they, they back and in Europe. They, that's a, this line, it's around 55 to 30,000 years ago when they first appeared. So you see over here in the Americas, they were the last group of people to come into another land space. You notice that their haplogroups for females will be designated by A, X, D, B, and A, C and B and D, you find in South America. So those are the haplogroups. I think you might get a little better understanding if you look at this. The haplogroups in Africa tend to have L letters. The haplogroups in Asia, there's some of these, you know, F, B, but you also find them in parts of Europe because, by the way, you know that Europe is not, oops, I'm sorry, you know what happened? My, um, what do you call it? My little, my board just went off. Give me a second. I don't really need, I need that. I'll get it in a second. If you, let me see if I can go back up. Oops, no, nope, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay. Um, I, did, I think I missed it. Where is it? Mm -mm. Nope. There it is. If you look at the, the locations, you'll see uh, where most of these different haplogroups are, are found. Okay, let me see if I can go to the next one. Nope, it's this one. I don't know why it's changing because what I want is to show you. Oh, yes, this is right. I, I'm showing you a haplogroup, a haplotype. This is my haplotype. It's L3, which says it's in Africa. And then there's a little, these are little sub subclades of L3, E1A3. And this is my grandmother. This is my mother and this is me. We all share the same deep maternal ancestry. L3E1A3 is about 10,000 years, years ago. In other words, this is about 400 generations ago. And it's found in people who are in Central and Southeastern Africa, maybe Angola, okay? And so when I found that out, I was like, wow, this is so interesting. You know, that I have a little piece of DNA in my mitochondria that actually came from an ancestor who lived about 400 generations ago, okay? In Sub-Saharan, in, in Southeastern Africa, maybe around Angola. Okay, here's the next one. So once again, I'm showing you a map of, of the L's in Africa because that's the one that most of us, in fact, um, most Africa, people of African descent African of the diaspora will have as their deep maternal ancestry. Okay, well, guess what? Sharon did her, she found out about her maternal ancestry. And so I want her to, um, from 23andMe, it says, it gives her maternal ancestry and it says, your haplogroup group shared with speakers of the Bantu language family traces the long line of women in your family. Well. Sharon, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can tell us a little bit about your maternal haplogroup, where it's located and what you thought about it. Are you going to bring it up so they see it or just tell them? Um, no, you, I'm going to let you tell them. I didn't, I, I didn't, that's the only thing, well, that is the only thing I, I got of it. You can either discuss it or if you can okay. bring it up, fine, but I'm not yeah. sure that you no, can. No, no. I, I'll, I'll just say it. Um, yeah. My haplogroup is L3B. I discovered and um, I can't pull it up because you're sharing your screen. Um, oh, well, let me see if I can. I can get out of the share. I had sent to you. You have it there. I don't know if you. No, I don't have that one. With you, I just had this. I'm not able to bring up my. Um, okay, it's okay. You can talk from it. So I found out that I am from Sub Saharan. Africa, my haplogroup is L B L3 B. And that is some two hundred thousand years. Am I saying that correct? 
Like That's right, 200,000 years ago, right? And it showed you where in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, they, um, they actually pinpointed to the area and showed you, like Dr. Withers showed you the migration. Um, and it literally pointed me to the Caribbean. Oops, I'm sorry. Oops, am I, I going ahead? I hit the wrong thing, I'm sorry. Okay. Forgive me, there it is. <laughs> Should I go into that part about that showing me in the Caribbean or am I going too far ahead? No, you're gonna get that. Okay, all right. Yeah, that so part is even more interesting. Okay. This is, so that's this it for, for the haplo group. Yeah, you know, 23andMe provides, um, some of the other companies don't provide that. That's why sometimes I choose it as the first company because they, it actually does give you your deep um, maternal or paternal ancestry, okay? Um, let me see if I can put this thing back where it needs to be. It's not a problem. Okay, so let's go. I do say that while they say this is where you come from, Africa is so diverse that even if you say you are L3 or L2, if you notice there's this circle of regions, like in the South, there are a lot of, the majority of people are, are shared in this little part right here. You see right here? Most of the people in that region have this particular uh, haplogroup, but also in this region, there are these haplogroups. So they could say mainly you were in, you know, um, Southern Africa, but you might be over here. Your ancestor might have come from there. But what, the way they do it is whatever your haplogroup turns out to be, they tend to choose the region where there's the largest number of people with that haplogroup. That's mm -hmm. true, particularly for Africa. So when people say, oh, I'm from the Cameroon, you better to say I'm from a particular region and most likely it's where the Cameroon is. You mm -hmm. understand? Yeah. Um, but it's still very, very informative and it makes you feel good to know something about that. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna do a little bit of quickie on paternal haplotypes because um, as, as uh, I told Sharon, you don't have a Y. <laughs> Why don't I have a Y? I get your your brother has a Y because he's a male. And she said to me, what'd you say to me, uh, Sharon? <laughs> What are you gonna do? I gotta yes. get him to get it done because I gotta find out. <laughs> she wants to find out her deep paternal oh, ancestry. My deep paternal ancestry. That's yeah. right. So once again, the haplogroups are named with, with letters. And you notice that, that they are unique pretty much to a region. Mm -hmm. And uh, Native Americans, uh, males have haplogroups lettered with Q and C. And then RB1, that's, that's one that's still up into the, in the wonderment, but it came out of Europe. Uh, if you look in Africa, you have, this is where Y chromosomal Adam, the, the, well, he was originally over here, but uh, the Y chromosome deep paternal ancestry is not as old as the mitochondrial. But that's not because they didn't have males back then. It just says that the males that survived and uh, actually, and contributed to all the other males in the world was this mitochondrial atom who occurred a little later in the history. It's, I said, because males are always fighting, so they killed off some people. And mm -hmm. the one that survived, you know, that's, that's kind of hand waving, but it's true that the uh, Y line is not as old as the um, mitochondrial line. But it didn't mean they weren't males back 100,000 years ago when um, mitochondrial Eve um, first lived. Okay, and here's a nice little graphic that shows you Y chromosomal Adam. And the oldest haplogroup is the A haplogroup. And then they're showing the other haplogroups that are in fact uh, later on in the history of, um, of human of males. And the more recent ones are down here, the R, the Q. You notice, remember you saw Q in, in the Americas, the O and the N. So notice the main thing is to know these haplogroups are named by letters and they're located, each of these are located in a particular region in the world. If you'll notice over here, here's, here's the Africa and 
they're showing the A haplogroup. And notice the diversity up here. Uh, that's a, a kind of an artifact because there's greater diversity in Africa than there is in else, other places, but I won't go into why that is. It has to do with who did the science. But if you notice, there's not as much diversity in the Americas because the people came into the Americas last and they haven't been here a long time to populate and, and their DNA change over time. Okay. And I thought I'd share with you the haplotype of my family since I don't have a male. I said, let me go. Um, we don't have a male person um, that we did it as part of our talk. Um, the haplotype for this is my grandfather on my father's side. This is my father. This is my brother. And this is my nephew, his son. They all have R-A-260. Well, they are this, this particular haplotype or group haplogroup is about 3,800 years old. And if you look in the world now, about 80% of the people of males in Ireland or Wales, that's Great Britain, have that haplogroup. And some, along the coasts of Spain and France, about 60% do. Now, what I ask, well, which ones? Well, it turns out by looking at my genealogy, I really think the Withers line actually is Great British. So most likely this 80% this Ireland and Wales is where that ancestor came from, okay? And if you look at the history of RA260, it goes all the way back 275,000 years ago to East Africa, mitochondrial, I mean, excuse me, Y chromosomal atom. And over the years, 6,000, it moved north across the Red Sea to West, Western Asia. Then it moved again and again until it went into Africa, I mean, to uh, Europe until about 5,000 years ago. It was the most recent ancestor to RA260 was RM26. Okay, and it changed until finally people who lived in this region of the of Europe had this particular um, haplotype, haplogroup. Now, why is that? Think about what happened in slavery. It had one way mating where a European man made it with an African woman. So the only Y that the offspring could get would be a European Y. And if you remember, I told you about 20%, what time is it? Oh gee, it's getting late. Um, about 20 to 30% of all African-Americans have a European Y. Okay, this is autosomal DNA and I'm not gonna show you that because I want, um, I'm not gonna go into that. Autosomal just tells what percentage of this, that, and the other thing. What I wanna do is show you that this is what they call admixture. And if you look at this individual here, they actually have DNA from all of these ancestors. You see that? But I wanna, and this is an example of an African-American, an average African admixture of an African-American. The Mediterranean and the Northern European are both European. Sub-Saharan Africa, Southern Africa, Southwest Asian is made in, in Native Americans, a little bit of Native American. So it shows that a lot of uh, all African Americans do have Native American ancestry, but it's not as great as the African ancestry and the European ancestry. So that's the average African American. Okay, Sharon, talk to us about your 23andMe results. Wow. <laughs> Oh, I have it here. This oh, is okay. <laughs> so I, she's not going to go into details because this is the first page. If you click into this, it'll give you even more details. But talk first about uh, this part here. Well, I um, I was very surprised that it literally was able to show me that I was, you know, where in the Caribbean that it, it actually took me to Jamaica, which is where I'm from. That's where my family is from. And that I am, and it showed me in Jamaica where my father is from one part of the island and my mother is from another side. And it actually did show me that 
that's where I had a lot of um, what's the word? Um, relic, not rel What's the to show that a lot of that relatives, relatives mm -hmm. were in that area. Mm -hmm. But then it also showed me that I was uh, seventy something percent. Um, I was forty five percent Nigerian and twenty three percent Ghanaian, Liberian, Sierra Leonean, and and it actually made sense because. And then wait, wait, and then it showed me that I had like 20% South Asian and like 4% European. And it really made sense because my, my, my mother's grandmother, so the mitochondrial line, my grandmother, my mother, to me is very strong. That's the African, she was a maroon. My grandmother was a proper maroon out of Portland, Jamaica, right? Which is where you find them, but one of the areas that you find them. And then my 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 mother's father was a was a Scottish person that was a that was living in Jamaica, but a half is it okay to say a half breed Scottish? Doctor Withers, what's the proper terminology to use? I want to what? say ancestors he was, you know, he, was your, he was one of your your genealogical ancestors right. and this, yeah mm -hmm. and so and so but then then that was a little weaker and when i checked on um i saw the south asian side it piqued my interest because my father's grandfather came to jamaica from india he's a punjab so i was just mm -hmm. blown away that this this it told me that like I was like, okay, so they're not really, they, they know something then. Okay, all right. This, yeah. this kind of makes sense just based on my knowledge of my family history. And now I want to know more. I want to right. dig in and I, I think what was really great was that you found out, you verified something that yeah. you knew in your genealogy and your ancestry, your recent yeah. ancestry. And so I found your 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 results fascinating. We actually talked a long time about this, by the way, yeah. uh, folks. <laughs> The it other thing I want to mention over here, because I want to leave a little bit of time for some questions. I know there'll be more than we'll have time for. They all tell you who your relatives are. In other words, they match your DNA pieces with other people who have tested. And it turns out that she has some close relatives that are either mm -hmm. third or fourth cousins, about 208 of them in the database. And you can elect to contact them and they can elect to respond. Mm -hmm. There also are some relatives. These are people who are not as close, they may be fifth, sixth, seventh cousins um, who share a little bit of DNA, but they go way, way back. But then when you really get into this stuff, you may in fact explore some of these, what they call relatives. Okay, let me go to the next one. Thanks, thanks Sharon. We had a wonderful time to, uh, talking about this. Um, but anyway, here's another example. These are actually people I did, but I changed their names. Here's someone, um, a young man, he is, West African, he's South African, Northern European, and it matched his, uh, this piece, it matched his uh, genealogy, and Southern European and East Asian and Native Af American. These are probably the people, he's from Guyana, and this part is probably representative of the Native Americans in Guyana. Mm -hmm. This is a young lady that I did, uh, worked with, uh, who's an African American, and I noticed she's quite an admixture, which is what we see a lot in African Americans with a large percentage of African, you know, West African, Central and mm -hmm. South African. And then uh, here's the, the, the European part and she has some Native American. This Southeast Asian is also most likely Native American. Okay, so I thought you might like that. Here's a little, a little comment like, um, your, you have 100% of your DNA, 50% of it came from your parents, 25%, this is the upper limit 25% probably came from your grandparents, great-grandparents, all the way down to the sixth generation, you have a little bit. Now you may do this and not get anything about your great-grandparents because it's really um, what they, uh, this uh, biological thing called recombination. And in that it's like shuffling of DNA uh, of chromosomes and you may not see this, but this is um, on average what you'll get from your ancestors when you look at your, um, biogeographical uh, results. And I just thought this is the last thing I would show you. This is an average African-American. Notice that there's no such thing as a pure anybody. This is a British average of um, profile and it represents actually 
how the the migratory path of British, the Mediterranean, Southwest Asian, and Northern European. And notice that the Bermudian looks something like the African American because they're both part of that diaspora. And this is Yoruban, which is really Nigerian. And notice them large sub-Saharan African with a little bit of Southern Africa. And this is the this is the Kiosian, but these are the the uh, what they use Bush people, but they don't like that term. They actually are the oldest um, living uh, people living now with the deepest ancestry. And they are mainly Southern African and Sub-Saharan African. If any of you know anything about the Bantu expansion, it's explained by that. There's a word about confidentiality and I put in the chat two websites in which you can go and look at and read about confidentiality because the genetic science uh, has changed tremendously in the last 15 years in medical research treatment and in law enforcement. And I think you need to know a little bit about it, but the companies that really protect your confidentiality right now the best are 23andMe, Ancestry, and MyHeritage. Um, and you'll learn a little bit about that in those websites. So DNA can help us to go back and get it. It's an essential research tool for gene genealogy. Tests are available to anyone. They provide good information to uncover, confirm, and expand your genealogical information about relationships and ancestors. But DNA does not provide a complete family tree. They are addendums. Your DNA results may not share with all of your genealogical parents, siblings, or cousins. You have a genetic uh, ancestry and you have a genealogical ancestry. And your ethnicity cannot be predicted absolutely. They're based on these reference database and bases, and they get updated as more people and more information is put into it. And usually based on regions and not countries. Take that with a little grain of salt because countries are man-made boundaries. They are not regions. And DNA ethnicities are statistically uh, uh, determined by algorithms that provide estimates. Algorithms are sometimes improved and defined and you go in there and you'll see that your biogeographical information has changed slightly. It just means it's gotten better. So with that, I want to give, say thank you. We may have some time for uh, questions and answers. And thanks to Ovden uh, for uh, your wonderful oral history project and, uh, and to also thanks to Weeksville. And that's it. Um, hopefully we will have a little bit of time to get some questions. Yeah, it looks like Sharon has something to say, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Sharon, please. Thank you. The, what I'm curious about is, what if, you're a, what if you have only a son, like in my situation, I only have one child and it's a son. Mm -hmm. Well, he's going to get his, and his father has already passed on. But he has a Y that he got from his father. That, right, but he so he can get his. You can get his your his father's deep paternal ancestry. But he, he can't get anything from my side because I don't have a daughter. Doesn't or, matter. He you don't need that. When you he's got fifty percent of his DNA from you, and fifty percent from his father. So when you do him, you'll get bio. You'll get information from both sides, the mother's okay. side and the father's side. Okay. But in addition, he'll get the Y. And the Y will tell you something additional about the father. Okay. okay? Clear. So it's, it, it would be worthwhile doing him because you'll get him some information about his father. Absolutely. And then you can prepare some results with yours and see mm -hmm. that part that is contributed by the father. You can we do that. That's, that's further down the road yeah. with DNA analysis. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And... Uh, there is a good question from Hollis Gentry. Uh, I'll read the question, but Hollis, you can unmute yourself um, if I butcher it and um, just provide some more follow-up with this. So uh -huh. it says, Dr. Withers, my brothers and I tested and uh, found a common cousin. She uh -huh. shows up as a first cousin for my brother and a second cousin for me. How is this possible? Oh boy. Mm. <laughs> well, let me first say that you're, you're genetic genealogy is different from your um, uh, your genealogical pedigree. Uh, I'd have to look at more. It is possible 
that, let's see, you and your brother, did you show up as, as sister and brother? Yes. Okay. This is Hollis Gentry. But yeah. we're, we are outliers in the sense that my brother and I share uh, smaller than would be expected of siblings. Uh -huh. We don't look alike, but we do have. You I don't mean, have to look alike, darling. You can no, no, no. Alike. What I mean is, in terms yeah. of my um, my brother matches very highly with an aunt I tested, and so uh -huh. did I. He matches more with her DNA than I do, and he matches more with his first cousin than I do. Uh -huh. but, yeah. Well, I'm gonna tell you, uh, it could be that he is the son of the of 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 your aunt. Oh no, no, no. I mean. We, that's not the issue. He can't be her, 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 her. Okay, um, good. Let me, I didn't understand. Because of the, no, because of the ages, he's not even possible to be her. Oh, okay. That's not what I'm questioning. I'm trying okay. to figure out how this woman can show up as his first cousin, but my second cousin. Well, first of all, um, it depends on how much of the DNA that's shared. Remember, those are estimates. Okay. And sometimes the estimates show that you are one a relative and uh, like particularly in that case and when actually by the estimate it's a little different from your genealogy i'd have to see it to really okay. get that answer because if you look at they'll give you percent of share or they'll give you something called centigrams yes. you have to kind of look at that to determine there's a lot of times when they tell you the percent sharing they give a range yes so that a relative that says you are this may in fact based on the range be the other relative, you know okay. what I'm saying? So I don't have to see the actual yeah. percentages to say that or, or uh, explain most likely what's going on, but that I'm, can't happen. Okay, I, I, I guess I was trying to figure out um, a strategy for where I should look because, uh -huh. you know, I've, I've um, traced both of our families back to a certain time. So I, I laugh at it because I have a record copy but I'm trying to figure out where to look at, uh, amongst all of the DNA matches and what direction to go. Oh, but, a question. Is, do you know this aunt? You know who this aunt is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I know I have documented all of the known family okay. members. Well, that, yes. that, that yeah. can make it kind of easy because yeah. you no, can go she's to like, the next step. Uh, no, less difficult. Let's put it that way. My 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 issue is that my parents and grandparents are all deceased. So they died before... <laughs> The DNA testing was possible. The only one aunt that I have, I have seven other aunts. She's mm -hmm. the only one who agreed to take a DNA test. Well, she that is, is quite common, by the way. And she's 17 years younger than my mother. So she was a child when I was born and my oh, brother was born. So that's why I'm saying I know it's not an issue. Yeah, with I that. probably yeah. could take a look at that and help you with it because a lot of it would require you to do some matching of segments. Okay. Okay. You know, the matching segments to see uh what what part of the dna actually matches certain parts of your dna or your brother and you can do that but it's the next level well it's like yes. two levels okay. up in looking at results okay but that 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 is not uncommon by the way and that's okay. what i'm saying okay don't thank worry you. she's she's part of, she's related even yeah. at the genetic level okay thank you yeah sure another question maybe um, we don't have any set up in the chat, but I have allowed people to unmute themselves if they have any questions that they want to. Um, you know, if you go down to the reactions, oh, you can raise your hand. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you go to the reaction button, you can raise your hand like that. Oh, I see. I see somebody. Okay. Hi. Oh, yeah. There is Kangela. And I'm sorry, did I, did I say your name correctly, Miss Moore? Angela, yes. Kangela. Oh, that's a nice name. Thank you. So I, you know, I did Ancestry and I did 23 Me, mm -hmm. and um, it actually took me where my father was and my, my mom in the Gullah region. And um, what I found interesting was that um, I just met my father like at the age of 49. So mm -hmm. I went down to um, Georgetown, South Carolina and met him and his family and everything like oh. that. And what, what, what I find interesting is that some people are not forthcoming with um, actually, you know, messaging. So I was sending messages to some of the same people I met when I went down there. Uh -huh. 
say, hey, you know, um, if you know of, you know, this person, he's my father, blah, blah, blah. They never got with in touch with me. And I say that to say that when, you know, you're looking for relatives and trying to make a connection, to be open to people that are finding, trying to make a connection, especially when they show up as second and third and yeah. first cousins, very close. Mm -hmm. And um, so I happened to find them when I went down south and it was like, oh, you know, um, people are just kind of scared to make that connection. They don't understand really the depth of those uh, tests in regards to, you know, making connections. They just think, oh, I took yeah. the test and yeah. I'm 23%, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, you know, I've connected family and um, what it uh, Australia. I've connected family and um, Arizona, mm -hmm. um, Mississippi. And um, if it wasn't for COVID, I'd probably be flying all over the world, just you know, making, figuring out who's who and meeting people. You have but, made um, an excellent, excellent point that just because you see the connection. Mm -hmm. the DNA, these, you won't get some responses if you reach out and some of them don't want to respond even if they see it. And so, and also there are people who you will say, even a close aunt, you say, auntie, will you take the test because I want to, and they'll say no. Nope. So mm -hmm. it is really quite a challenge to, but don't get discouraged and don't be, feel badly, you know, about it because that's just the way it is. You're fortunate enough that you've got some responses and there's another level that you can deal with that DNA, do some matching. That's another whole, as I'm sure Linda will know, that's another whole level of DNA exploration. And it just starts with where we are. But when you see how many genetic cousins, I mean, I looked at mine, how many genetic cousins did I have? I forgot, 3,000, 4,000 genetic cousins. Wow. Wow. And I, you know, that's what it means. It has to do with how long I've been. I'm not talking about close relatives. Mm. I'm talking about distant relatives. Yes, distant it's, relatives. It has to do with how long, actually, my parents, my parents, my mother's line, my father's line have been in this country. You understand? And, yeah, they're what I call historically African Americans in this country. Yes, so they go yeah, back yeah. a long way. So you would expect, and if you go, if I go back far enough, I look at some of those little pictures, and some of them mm -hmm. look European American. Yes, they, they do. Are. Did you see that? Yes, yeah. yes, so, they do. Yes. So don't be discouraged, but I love that thing about uh, the gullah part and, and actually following through and finding somebody. I saw oh, another yeah. hand. Um, okay, hi, Linda. Hi, wonderful program. I learn something all the time. Two <laughs> things. There's Miss Vassal on the... Uh, are you related to Dr. Vassal? That's just for you. And Doris, I wanted to find about the X DNA test. I have a double great grandmother who's uh -huh. very mysterious. She appears on two censuses and disappears. So I was just trying to see if I could do something using the X DNA. You you can take that test. You can. Uh, it's not. It's the company that does that is um, Ancestry DNA. I had a little chart, and it's not cheap. Ah. The way they do it, they do uh, the whole X. And okay. once you get the whole X, you can do some comparisons um, that are more fine than when you only do the regular one. Okay. I could okay. talk to you about that later. I actually, I haven't done the whole X, by the way. Okay. Um, but yes, you may be able to find out recent um, ancestry in on the maternal line by actually taking looking at the whole X. The uh, sequence on the whole X. I'd be interested. And in you that. actually have two, and they are mixtures on 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 females because they're matched, so they have mixing, you know. Oh, okay. But but you you can do some uh, explorations with those um, to try to find out something about that relative. Yes. Right. Good. We we'll talk offline. You will talk, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I saw another hand somewhere. Well, well, Dr. Withers, we have two questions um, in the chat. Okay. Um, one is from Joan Bockel. Uh, I hopefully, hopefully I said that right, Joan. Uh, thank you. This has been most informative. Is there a way to learn what tribe you are from? I find oh. that very useful given that political lines were drawn well, much later. I know you'd like to know what tribe, and they may tell you what tribe, but it's that's not something that can be informed by DNA. 
not, not accurately. It can give you a region. And then you can also begin to do some genealogy. For example, the lady that I told you about, um, that's a good book. You have to do some, some um, work both in genealogy as well, in, as well as in DNA. The DNA will give you a region, okay? In fact, it gives you regions. But along with your deep maternal ancestry, along with your autosomal, you might be able to uh, narrow down a region and then find out the, 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 the tribes that came from there. I think I can find it. Let me see if I can find that on my PowerPoint. Under the I, I have a question. Okay. Um, I'm going to see if I can find that uh, one so I can show you what I mean. It won't take me long if I can get them it's slow. Uh, da, 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 da. Here it is. Okay. I'm trying to now display that particular slide. Let me try it from here. Now it keeps going back to where I don't want it to go. Oops. See this slide? This woman uh, whose name is um, Mildo Hall, she's a very interesting story about which I won't share with you now. But she has done this book and she, she had done some work with some of the uh, um, information that was recorded about slave, enslaved people coming into uh, this country. And they, in those uh, documents, they actually talked about where some of these Africans came who were enslaved. And she, if you look at, the, if they said, okay, um, if you find some DNA that West Africa, well, what, is, what, what, what countries are in this region here? Then you could look here to see some of the tribes that are in that region, like Nigeria, you see that? The Igbo, the Mbundu, uh, the Yoruba. That might be where you can do it. I know that ancestry, the African ancestry gives you a tribe. And, there, and actually, um, there has been some criticism about being able to do that because if you'll notice the other slide I showed you, to show that, that there's such a mixture of people in a region. Let's see if I can get there. I didn't want to come out because what happens is, see this? There are a lot of different DNA types in a region. So to determine what is a specific tribe, they're not yet able to do that. And the same thing is true for, um, uh, the why too it just shows you that you can't say oh this this tribe because there are also these tribes in there you you see what you get my my drift as they say you get what i'm trying to share with you it's hard to determine tribe the details of tribal dna of a particular tribe is far more fine in, D, in, in DNA differences than what you get for a region. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe as they continue to get more and more samples of DNA from people who are indigenous to the African continent, they may begin to see differences. They might say, you, you're in Nigeria, but it looks like you're Igbo, Igbo. You understand? Yes. So a lot of times what they do, if they, uh, as they find more, you can go back into your results and they will have refined it. And you might see something additional, but right now the answer to that is no. You can't really tell what tribe. All right, thank you for that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and we have a question from, we have a couple of really good questions. We have a question from Ford P. Um, I, did a, I did a Y DNA test with family tree DNA for my yeah. dad and it's mm -hmm. different than the haplogroup showing in 23andMe, is this possible? Uh, there are two reasons, it's generally no. Usually the haplogroups are the same across companies because uh, deep maternal and paternal ancestries are pretty accurate. But there's something that happened, well, did you do them at different time frames? Because they have changed the naming of the Y haplogroups in recent times. So 
example, my my father's in that line originally was R1B something or another. But now it's the same haplogroup, but has been renamed as A260 or whatever I showed you. So it could be that one company has named it using the old nomenclature and the other company is using the new nomenclature. What I would suggest you do is take the, the two uh, haplogroups and Google them and see if they come up to be the same. Okay, yeah, they were they were taken within a couple of months and they both say E dash L. I mean, I'm sorry, E dash, but one is E dash L and one is E dash M. Oh, so well, I just thought that was weird. No, it's not that. In that instance, it may be that uh, one database informs one way because they both are E. I would have to, you know, what you mm -hmm. can, what I would be able to do is look at the um, ancestry relationship charts and see if those two are close together. And in that case, it would mean that the one algorithm picked them up and put them in that group and the other algorithm picked them up and put them in another group that's closely related. You know what I'm saying? Did I make sense? Okay. Yeah. Ancestry relationship charts. Okay. Yeah. And you and actually right, what cool. I would do is I would put I would Google both of them, put them in there and see where they say they are located and then put the other one in and see where it's located. They might be close to one another regionally. And that's okay. why one guy Thank that, you so much. That, yeah, that because if you had said that they were quite different in, in, in haplogroups, I might have said, well, mm, but um, I think that might help. That might help. Great. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. What's the other one? Um, and then we have one. Qu we have one question from Daniel Van Dun, um, and I know that Donna um, had a question, so I'll read Daniel's, and then we'll tab Donna to ask hers. Okay. Um, so with Danielle, um, and I'm just, I'm reading this for the recording. Okay. Um, I've been trying to track my paternal grandmother. She passed at 102. We kept some of her hair hoping to test it, but was oh. told it is not possible. Mm -hmm. She has a living niece from her half brother. Will having her test to tell us anything? Okay, first, um, no, you won't be able to get anything from the hair. It's quite old. But the other thing is, it's very, very, very expensive. Because that's a forensic thing. That's not an ancestry thing. I, somebody asked me that too, but they had just gotten some hair from somebody uh, who had passed, who was a relative. The answer to that is basically no, not from hair. Even though in recent times in a crime scene, if there's some hair, there's still a little bit of uh, the root there. And in, you have to do a far more uh, technical way of isolating the DNA and it's very expensive and basically they don't do it for, you know, um, regular folks. The answer basically is no, if it's old. Um, and what was the other one about, um, you have a, could you tell me about the other piece she asked? What can she find out from a particular- Oh, um, and then she has a living niece from her half brother. Uh, will having her test to tell us anything? It's a niece who is, she has a, a half brother. The grandmother had a half brother. Yeah, you'll get something, but you won't get a lot. You won't get as much as if it were a full brother, but you you may get something, but the way you'd have to get about doing it is to begin to match DNA segments and finding what segment it goes with what family versus another family. You can, you can do that, yes. You may find something, but that's what, two generations ago? Hmm. It is possible, but you'd have to uh, do some, uh, what they call uh, DNA matching of segments and identifying one segment coming from one family versus another. It is possible to find a little bit about that. Yes, matching it with you because you have some DNA from your grandmother, right? Where is she? You have DNA from your grandmother. And so you, you can identify pieces of your DNA from your grandmother and look for it in this niece. Okay. We've that's done hand -waving, uh, ancestry. But that's, that's how you would do that. Yeah. Yeah, we did the ancestry DNA. Yeah. Yes, but you'd have to also get your that niece, that 
grand it was a grandniece, right? Yeah. Yes. You'd have to get her to test. And then you'd okay. have to see what segments match. Okay. And that might inform you about your, your own grandmother. Because remind you, you have about well, on average, you have about 12% of your grandparents' DNA in, in, in your DNA. Yes. It may be less, it may be more, but it's in that range. And if you see some matching pieces in that grandniece, that might tell you something about, you won't be able to do the, well, you have, uh, your grandmother is, it's on, you have a, 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 the mitochondrial DNA from your grandmother, if it is your maternal grandmother. My paternal. She's my paternal. Oh, no, no, that won't show. Um, do you have an uncle? Nobody's still living. Oh, yeah, that is a problem with a, a lot of us. You know, we know that if we had this person living, it's not just that they won't do it. Some of them can't do it because they're dead. And that a lot of times you sow genes. And there are dead ends, genetic dead ends, because you cannot test and find and, you know, get somebody who will provide you some DNA on that line. Yes. But, you know, one would have to, well, let's say it is possible, but it would require some, getting some DNA from that, um, that, that particular grandniece and then doing some assessments analysis of segments. And that's like a two levels up from just getting sequel, getting the, you know, the information, but it's possible may be possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, hope, you, hope you find some more stuff. Maybe you need to do some more genealogy and then you might be able to find some more things about her, hmm. you know? Thank you. That, that might happen. It would be nice to find it, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could do the paternal, like I could do my paternal grandfather, but my mm -hmm. paternal grandmother is well, just you know, missing. If you get a really good genealogy person you have one here that's that's linda rhodes jones she's very good at um helping people identify their relatives genealogically you know um i've seen it happen several times with her so sometimes you can contact a genealogist and help you find what they go break through a brick wall that's what they call it um, thank you yeah sure wonderful dr withers and everyone yes. I, I hate to, to rush, but I have to jump off. I have yes, I know you told me earlier that you had to jump off. Sharon, thank Gordon, thank you so thank much. You for so out, much. Thank you. I really, we, we will talk some more, yeah, but yeah. I really, really enjoyed having you as, as one of our presenters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Right. yes. So stay well and we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Okay, it, maybe yeah. you see it's getting kind of late, but um, you have another question, I'll entertain it. Yeah, I think, um, I'm pretty sure Donna, Donna Sloan had a question that she, um, she wanted to ask. Um, okay. So I'll allow, allow her to ask it. Um, go ahead. Okay, Donna, you, okay. I see you unmuted. Yeah, uh, my question is this, uh, we had our, Paternal DNA tested my um, and at ancestry.com, and they told us generally that we were from Ethiopia. Then we had the same test done. Then we sent this off then to African Ancestry, and they uh -huh. told us that we were from the Oromo tribe of Ethiopia. And this was 99. We're 99. Point, our DNA matches the Oromo people 99.4 percent. Now, um, uh -huh. uh, so I, I guess what I I wonder then, uh, you, you said that basically speaking for tribes, it's hard to really determine. And I wonder- Well, uh, yeah, I know what you're speaking of. I, I happen to know a little bit about African ancestry. I'd actually know Rick Kittles. Mm -hmm. um, and his, when he first started doing this, he had a database that was very well informed with African uh, sequences, mm -hmm. far better than these other companies. All right. And um, he having a lot of uh, reference DNA and knowing where those uh, people were with that reference DNA and knowing who they are, you can make certain predictions about uh, DNA that's submitted to him on his database. By the way, he's not cheap either. He, he right. tried, his stuff is quite pricey. I know, because I've done him too. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I would say one of the criticisms they have about um, ancestor, uh, African ancestry is precisely what I said before, but I'm not as strongly critical of African ancestry as the, you know, the um, professional literature says, because he does have a strong um, reference database of real Africans living in different regions, particularly on the west coast of Africa. Okay. Not so much on the east coast. Yours right. is kind of. So yeah. I would say I would I would um, hold on to that and say it's probably that with him okay. because there's a match. You're saying Ethiopia, and he's actually saying what group? Right, right. Let's try. Right. So so that 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 has some good confidence level. I wouldn't say okay. it's a hundred percent. Okay. But I would give it. He says ninety nine. Please actually it's giving you some good. He's hedging, but it's a strong okay. hedge. All right. And yes. what he said is that this, um, our DNA matches the Oromo tribe of Ethiopia today. The yes, Oromo right. The live there today, 99.4%. Mm-hmm. Let me say something, too, that you mentioned it. The, you're not comparing your, the, your samples to ancient DNA. Right. You're comparing it to people who are existing now right. in okay. a region. Mm-hmm. And they call them indigenous people, meaning that right. they're the people who lived in that region for many, many, many generations. Okay. We're not right. indigenous. No, not at all. Even though we <laughs> might have been here five, six generations. Four hundred years, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the fact that they gave you, you're kind of fortunate that he has some data, some sequences in his mm-hmm. database okay. that he knows belong to those particular tribes, people in that region. Okay. So I would give that a little bit of um, higher up uh, credibility. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. yeah so I, wouldn't... I wouldn't kick that one to the curb. No, okay. I would kind of say, well, it looks like, and also the backup that the other company says it's in Ethiopia. Right. Okay. That, that's, yeah. that's pretty good data there. I yeah. would consider yeah. it. So okay. you're kind of fortunate because I, you don't always see that. Um, then, then I went to Ethiopia to meet some Aromi, 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 Oromo people. Yeah. And I took a picture of my daddy with me. Oh, good. <laughs> and well, they, said, they said, wow, yeah, he does. He, he looks Ethiopian. And yeah, he looks. And you want to know something else? My last name is, very, is an Ethiopian name. They spell it differently. We spell is that our, so? Yeah, we, we spell ours S L O A N. They spell it S L uh, S O L A N. That's great. So, yeah. Well, guess I guess what? We're... I think that's confirmatory <laughs> evidence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're using well, both thing, genealogy yeah. and DNA, yeah. uh-huh. genetic genealogy. I would say that would confirm it. Okay. Remember, I said you that's... don't just use DNA, you use your genealogy. Right, and right. Spelling uh-huh. and all of that. Also, you go and look at them and say, look like, look so like they my do. dad. They, they, my, yeah. my dad looks just like them. Okay. Okay. Then, I would say them. that it's good data. Yeah, my dad is now deceased, but I mean, uh, he, and the other thing I learned is that the Ethiopians uh-huh. first came to this country in 1808, and right. they founded the Abyssinian Baptist Church. That's right. Uh, in New York, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, I love so it. I, I haven't been able to go uh, go into my dad's uh, history to find out if my dad's people were on that boat that came over in 1808 or not. Yeah, uh, you, you, you can, if you were to get a, a, a very um, good genealogist, they mm-hmm. might be able to help you to find some more. But uh-huh. I would say, given what you just told me, I yeah. would say that's highly conf- a, a high probability and almost okay. confirmatory that, in fact, that line came from Ethiopia, from that tribe. Okay. I really would. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. I like hearing that. <laughs> yeah, it was very encouraging for us. On my mother's yeah. side, for the maternal DNA, it uh-huh. was not quite that accurate. Uh, the, yeah. um, from Ancestry.com, they were not able to give us a great deal of information at all. But That's from- because they don't, let me say this one other thing. The databases are not, do not have strong or a lot of uh, um, quote unquote third world people. In other uh, words, it's over, yes, yes. over yes, yes. informed on the European side. Right, They've right. been trying to include updated. Mm-hmm. Asians are not well represented. Mm-hmm. Africans are not well represented. Uh-huh. So when we go in as African Americans to look mm-hmm. where we match up, we are a lot of times won't get as good a data as say a European right. American. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. But, on, on uh, the- but they're working on it. Mm-hmm. So they're out there trying to get more samples in Africa, in Asia, 
okay. and the underrepresented to make their databases better, particularly mm -hmm. for people in Amer in the Americas, because we are admixtures. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, maybe if you look at your results, you know, two years from now, you might mm -hmm. get a little better kind of um, information. Right. Because they okay. update, they update these things. Mm -hmm. Now, on my okay. mother's side, the African ancestry told us that we were, uh, my maternal side, we were the scribes of the ancient Near East. That's what African ancestry told us, scribes from the ancient Near East. Maternal yeah, well, it, it may in fact be that. They, they, it, it, it isn't totally wrong, but it isn't totally accurate, if you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's how you have to read it, but it, it puts you in a ballpark. It doesn't put right, you in a right. base, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, then I went to Egypt, of course, because I wanted to see if I could find any of these scribes from the ancient Near East. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think I your trip have, going to I, Ethiopia was a better trip than going there. I didn't, yeah. I didn't have as much luck in Egypt. I didn't find any 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 connection there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Yeah. Well, that's, I, thank you for yeah. sharing that. It's very right. interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we only have time for maybe one more question, which is like, are there any books that you would suggest, Dr. Withers? Um, on DNA and Ancestry, there's several. Um, the one that I find helpful, it just in learning about DNA and Ancestry, not, not about uh, some of the historical pieces. In fact, if I could find it's one by Bettinger. Um, Hold it for a second. I might be able to show it to you. I, what you know? What no? Better yet. Oh, I, I'm, um, I posted. Right. There is there is one really pertinent question that I should ask. Uh, okay, ask. Um, while I look for the book because it's probably over here. Yeah. Um, do you have? It is. Okay. Let me see. So this last question I'll ask, uh, do you have suggestions for people who are adopted? I've been contacted by DNA cousins for help in locating their parents? Well, see, that is not only DNA, but it's also, I'll tell you, I did, I did work with one. Here's the book. I don't know if we can see it. Uh oh, it's backwards. Okay. But it's called uh, The Family Tree Guide to DNA Testing and Genetic Genealogy. And it's by this man named Blaine Bettinger. I've uh, attended several of his classes and online webinars. He's quite good. And it, it talks about, uh, you know, all aspects of DNA from the, the basics to some of the more complex things. Um, it's pretty good. There's another one, but I can't remember the name of it. I know what it looks like. And it's not, well, um, Alden, if I were to give you two books, can you, I'm you over here now, um, could you post them somewhere? I'd have to, the other one, I can't remember the name of, and I'd have to go and look for it in my house. I just had this one not too long ago. If you give me the two books, I can add them as resources to your slides. Okay. Um, oh, I and... know when we, when I give you the piece that you want me to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I'll put it we in. I'll to send some back the slides to, to all the participants. Okay, real good. Um, we'll work on that, and I'll give you I'll give you more than two. I'll give you three. This one is pretty good. Mm. It looks backwards here, but it says DNA, a family tree guide to DNA testing and genetic genealogy. It's pretty good. It's one of the best sellers, but there are a couple of others. Also, there are a few webinars that you can check out online. You can search them. They're, some of them are quite good. If I can remember one that is still available, I'll, I'll give that to you, Obden. Okay. Okay. Ob Obden. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we'll, we'll, we'll work that out, okay? Okay, yes. And then um, I know we have a couple more questions, but I think we're at time. Yeah. Um, you, you can provide these questions to research at weeksfield.com and I will forward them to Dr. Withers. Yeah, I'll see what I, yeah, that'll work. Um, it's been a great pleasure. Yes, I, I mean, as, as always. Talking yeah. to everybody and particularly, as my mother used to call people, uh, people of the diaspora, I'll use that, African diaspora, she called us us's. So we knew she was talking about our people. So it's been great talking to us's. You know? I really enjoyed that. And I hope that you um, will continue to explore your ancestry, your genealogy, and then you add a little bit of DNA into it too. Okay.
Yes. Um, so everyone, thank you so much for coming out um, for this workshop. Um, this is the, the final workshop of this um, programming series. Um, we, I hope that you all stay safe during these times and that you enjoy the end of the year and the holidays that are forthcoming and that um, you can at least try to connect with loved ones um, during a time where like distance is kind of the way you can show love. So um, uh, on that note, everyone, um, thank you again for coming out and uh, we hope to see you in uh, future programming. Yes. Thank you and stay and, safe. And stay well stay and uh, happy, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year and yeah. a healthy new year. Thank you and to you too.